control version of the package. And I just throw away the things and I do all the files for the top. Okay, and copy the stuff. That's a lot of things for any time. Okay, yeah. Can you show the command you used to install the package? I was. Yeah. It was here. Okay. This is the shell command. This is the Unix, Unix command line, and there's a command called R, which is start R. But if we don't want to run R, we want to run R installation process for this package. We say R, R, run the following command to install. And what, what package should you install? The one in the current directory. And it looks around and says, yes, this is a description file. It says, okay, now I know what to do. And it goes off because you've written it. You've written the, the, the structure of the directory, which is very special, and it obeys our, uh, our convention. And then this will be installed in that package. Okay. Yeah. It did. Yes. Uh, I would just do that from our studio. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is a thing. I, I'll tell you how. So there's two ways you'll do it from our studio. One of them is you'll find the development button or menu item, which I hate. Because <laughs> I can't read the people. Because every time I got a question, like, okay, and I really don't think my reach wasn't very well. But that's a pretty great way of doing this. But one of the things is not a at all. But there, it is nice to be able to reproduce this, which is, okay, I, here's what I'm actually going to do. I'm going to say, I would like you to install the following package, please. Okay? This is in R. So hence it's in our studio, too. Now, again, again, I'm showing stuff at you. Intentionally to not have such a motivating to actually ask me about to say how that looks so exactly. Is there anyone here talking that we've done before? Okay, then. Yeah. <laughs> you can think about it. The starting part. The starting part. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, the start of this part. That's what I'm saying. You can copy, so you can use the package.skeleton to make the package more kitty. <laughs> and then there's a, there's a button on our studio that says make this a package. Okay? And some of them need more than they need to do when they get, when they get confusing, but, but I'm all I'm going to get out of it. You need a description file, you need to fill in other few fields. So what you do is you just copy the one I gave you on GitHub and you take any existing file and you just change it. You don't have to change the email addresses or anything, you just leave them the way they are until you actually want to share this with somebody or that will become an issue. Um, okay, and then off you go. The, uh, so we, we can construct an R package quite, 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 again, I'm not, I'm not saying this is, it's just, it, there's no reason this should be obvious as to how to do it. You know, this is a man-made thing. It's designed for a particular purpose. It's not to be flexible, uh, but it's not super hard. It's, it's, it's easy, it's learnable. Okay, so if we do this, we can actually just install the package and we get exactly the same result because it calls exactly the same code of install this package. Notice what I said here was install the package where this directory. If I could give a path to the full search to get another directory of it. I don't have to be in the current system directory where the files are. And notice the way I do this is that by the way, don't go and look for this on the web. Just it's here. It's, it's right here. This is some of the so just interpret this as a path, not a UI. Okay. So this is what I um, I got lost with the whole uh, <laughs> the editing yeah. the file would be doing it manually, like if you were not. You could do it in our studio, but only by editing okay. the text. That's all. However, you want to control this. Uh, you know, I'm looking around and I see Max and I see this, yeah, yeah, yeah. and all of a sudden it's like, okay, and no matter what I do, it's not going to be familiar to somebody. And again, this is why I like to go down to the, 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 the come. Uh, and uh, but our studio is common to pretty much everyone here. So you use the it's text built and you can create files wherever you want. You can create directly. So this description file that you have uh, is, we can open that in our studio. You most certainly have open it. You can. So let me just do this. This is see the right part of the state line is shaded in the most. Okay. Uh, again, I work in office. Okay. 
answer is yes. It's just a text mm -hmm. editor. Go ahead and not and like this. Yeah. How do you How do you send it to me? Well, that's a very good question. Okay. So there's two ways to send it to me. One of them is to put it on gift up and then just and then or any 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 gift uh the property system, okay? Get up there, get labs, whatever you want. Make it public to everybody. And by the way, if you're worried, I'm going to be embarrassed. Get up. Okay. Yes. Uh, occupational hat. Okay. The uh, just put it on GitHub instead of send me the send me the URL for that. I get my gift from it. Or I just basically I just do uh, uh, I do I use dev tools, the dev tools package that just says install install on GitHub this um, this on this URL and then you know, it's just all there and it works for me. That means you're actually not an extra step if you put it on GitHub. That's a really good thing to do because that's not what I was saying to you. That's and you say, oh I'm sorry, I need the old version of that file. I got a better version and very much I'll be active and put it down put it in my file. I get confused now. I have version one by file through one through two through three, and like that. I get annoyed here. <laughs> okay, so you want better because if you put it on GitHub, then you just push the any changes, and I can see them now. Right? But in many cases, you are it, it, it's done. You're basically like, can I have to say, you're asking me for help. You're saying, I need your help. I'm going to stop working on this and, and, and you can look at it or, or, or that you're just ready to share the code with somebody else. It's kind of a stopping point. But you can do the following R command, uh, R command build. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Remember R command install. And this is R command build. Lowercase. Just connect. Okay. Okay. Uh, into now it's just like, sure, no problem. What this is actually done is a different way of actually getting into this file. It is now actually created a part of the new file. So that, uh, this file, uh, this new file type, that's the whole thing that we need, file type. Okay. Uh, and this has actually got version one of, the, of that package file. And now what I can actually do is you send that to me in an email. I just have one thing. I've got all your code, all your data, beautifully standalone, and kind of documentation if you so desire as well, or I can send it to that. And I can. So now what I would do is I would do the following too. And you can install that. I would just go ahead and do this. I just said sure, no problem. That's a very simple way of actually communicating, distributing your code to somebody else, including yourself. Okay, which is I want to put it on another machine. I get I I have access to a big machine upstairs. Okay, I've got a lot of cores, I've got a lot of memory, so it's great. If you want to go up here, off we go. Let's see, I, I copy this file across and install it. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Okay, or I use it as a download to my or to get down and then download it. Make sense? Like what I don't know that who uses it. Is that who's supposed to? Yeah, maybe. Okay. Okay. Um, sorry. Okay. That's uh, we've also all sorts of funny data here. We can actually use that. Okay. Great. Okay. Everyone happy? Yeah. Oh, um, I mean, earlier on, you used the file on the other machine. Yeah. Did you Find me the file that exists, and I had in my I, I created this in my source. You created this in your source, you sent it to me, I installed it, and I said, Go find that wherever you put it in, some, in a totally agnostic way. It was wherever it was, whatever, wherever you installed it, are go, go tell me the path to directly to that file. Now, here I was saying, If you ask for a file that doesn't exist, it will give you back nothing. Oh, that, that's all I'm getting up here. Okay. 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 And then, so you can use d.csv. So this is the name of the file. This is the actual name okay. of the file. So if, if uh, again, uh, so this is Bob. Uh, 
this is this is all there is in this package. Okay, there is a description file, and there's an inst directory, and under the inst directory, I created a file, a directory called my data, and underneath that, I created one one file called d.cd. And it, I, I can create lots of direct lots of files there and show what that I can do. Okay. Everyone happy? Uh, no, there's nothing you can't put in it. If you want to get this on CRAN, you shouldn't put up terabytes of data. Okay? We can put up just the general principles. Okay? There is a limit for CRAN. I thought, okay, the thing to do is no, you can put it in you want. And you're putting it there because it's you and your code in the package. And if you have code, or just a data directory, it's just a data package, that's fine, just put it in there. But if you want, if you want, uh, you're putting stuff there that your code may or may not use in the package, so it's, that, it's, it's, uh, that it's distributed with your package as opposed to the URL. It's a good and bad thing because if you, if you put stuff on the URL, then I, when I go get it, I'm always getting the most recent version. But if you actually want to walk some data down to try a particular version of the package, then you can do that. Okay? But yeah, you can put anything you want in there. Okay? Everyone happy? Yep. <laughs> the second way is to use the R command fill. Okay, so to, I, I've got this, and instead of installing the package, I say fill the package for me, and then that actually collects up all of the files in my in my in my source package. Okay, and it, it, and it puts it into a single archive, like a zip file with a R file. And then I have one file that contains multiple files. And this is even better still because, uh, if I go back over here, okay. so we built this. Now, uh, so this is actually what's in this big archive. Is it's got Bob, and it's got description, it's got the input, it's got the, the D.CSV, okay? And so it just actually goes and collects. All of the files that are relevant that, that are necessary for being for installing this package and makes a single file. And then we can then we can just share that one file, put it on box, do whatever you want with it. Okay, just sometimes we have to be able to let's by the way, there's a nice little trick here. It depends because so what I've got, those of you who are familiar with Git, you can use the notion of staging files. It's not there's a there's a weak analogy here too in, in our back. I have the store, this is the I go into the bottom directory here. This is not the install. That this uh, software this is not the install bar of the R package. This is the source. And then I tell it to install it, and I can install it in multiple places or it will all get collected. Both build and install will actually collect from the different needs and then install those. So if I have extra nonsense flying around with this, I can keep giving you one of those. So I can actually have extra data sets that I don't want to share, share with anyone. I'm using this uh, extra data set like local here, so I don't have to refer to these in weird ways. Okay, I can have code that I don't want anyone to see because I don't have to put it in there. I actually can start streaming certain files from the bill. Okay, and our command bill will actually look at files. I have a thing called over here is. A file called bar build with more. Uh, the hidden file or it does have a lot of building in it. Basically, I put in a bunch of regular expression patterns to say if you find a file like this, don't include it in the build. Okay, which means when you're creating that part of GD file, just understand these. So, this is a very handy way of getting rid of a file of, of uh, certain data files that you don't actually want people to have and so forth. And so it's not a command for excluding any file. It, it won't do. If you want to say, well, again, there's, uh, there's two different things. There's an install ignore and there's a build ignore, but what we could do use the build ignore for various reasons. Uh, you can not a command to ignore something. It is basically to say, hey, here's a list of patterns that I want you to ignore uh, when you're building the uh, when you're building package. And we put those patterns into the file name dot capital R build ignore. Okay? So it's a file.
file of the grid. And then each line is a path of this that looks for a dot dot r check. Okay, and this is a dot in the cell. And you can go and get your look at that in the whole next one. And you can start putting in all the things. Okay, again, one of the things if you don't understand this, yell. Okay, if you, uh, if you don't know why, I want to do this again for yell. If you don't understand all the details, don't worry about it. I want you just to be aware that you can do these things. And then you can look up the documentation and go and ask me a question or whatever it is. It's just, you should, these are good practices for actually how to build a package. So, the real way we actually do this is we build a package. So, we actually construct the file and we build and create the power file and then we install it over Okay, as well. So, we actually you can use our command and go on the law, on the directory or actually on the power file and build. Okay. Any, any questions? Again, why am I doing all this? I want you to share your code with me and the people to get any sense of the way. And it seems, I mean, it seems weird to me to be wasting 10 minutes setting up this directory. But it's your 10 minutes, not mine. <laughs> and if you want help from somebody, you can try to minimize the hassle of their life. But it's also going to set you up to be an easier to do. So you invest a little bit of time all of a sudden compared to a simple work workflow. Okay? Because if you have this on a kid's repository, and you can basically just install it on another machine and take that with one. Okay. Whereas if you have five files, well, we've got our files, we have a data file lying around as well, and two data files, five R files, you know, source each one in. You've got to get the order right. Okay. And then I have to repeat it. You have to repeat it every single time you get the chain. And it's really easy to change the file to get the source in. Well, that, that's the chain. And then you go, why doesn't it work? Change the code again, and you get the source that you can change it, and you actually undo the actual good thing. Okay, so this is a much more efficient uh, workflow. It's just it's reliable, it works, uh, but you have to invest a tiny bit of time. Okay, there's one other thing. So basically, which I want to look at was system.file. So it said, I don't know where the file is, but I do know it's under the package, the install package for the file. Please or go tell me where give me the full path to that. Then I can use it without having to on any machine to get up the whole point of this. This is another way of doing this for data file. For example, I put it here and I say data of the NT card data. Okay? There's an NT card. What a kind of card is it? Not in this. Okay. Um, how did that work? Is that R data? Pardon? Is that R data? It's an R data file. It's in a package. Okay? And I didn't use system.file read.cfd. The trouble with read.cfd is I have, to, I have to know how to control the columns. You're putting all the effort on me, the, the user, to read that CFD file and transform all the dates into dates as opposed to strings. I have to change the, I have to make sure not to use strings or factors or, or do not use factors. I don't know. I can't read the piece of code because the data set that you asked me to read in, I read it differently. Okay? And in fact, you know, especially in some cases, you have one machine with, which is, is which uses Russian as the, as the primary language, which means it's got a different character encoding. And I, I, I try to read it as a text or it would be a different answer. Okay, because my character is going to be different. Okay, that's bad news. So this is much nicer to actually get an R object, okay, a data frame that actually has everything pre-computed. Okay, and then I would just type data of, 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 of D, okay, or whatever it is. So instead of read that same thing. And there's really good time for me actually want to we have to say system that far, go find this image. It's not an R object, I don't want it to be an R. I want it to be a regular file that we manipulate in a certain way. Um, but there's other times when the data are special in an R package where I actually want to have data. Okay, I want to be able to have data and get the object in there. You pre process and actually customize exactly in the way you want it. It's just cleaned up the CFD file. So, how do you do that? I just want to be in a package. I want to say library of file data of D. Okay, that's the goal. It should be easier, but it's not for historical reasons. But I want to, I literally want to be able to type library of all 
and then I want to say data of two, and I want to say data of a copy because I actually want to take the people that's called two dot C of two to be like you guys see the different name now. How do I get this to work? Here's one approach. Okay. Let's, let's just do the ball. This is ball. Okay. Here's the two, we've got two directories. Two files in the description, two in the directory. I'm now going to create a different version of ball to be able to find out just extend this one to get them okay. And then I'm now going to create a directory for data. Okay. Now, notice by the way, this is not under the H directory, so it's not that's why I just want to get a copy of the box. This is a special one that I'll recognize as an actually containing data. Okay. Okay, so create the data. I go down into here. I'm going to run R, okay? I don't need a problem. I'm going to say read.cfp. I'm going to go do this part. Okay? So I'm creating the package myself. The user won't have to do this Okay? So you're doing this and we need to put the data. You do this one. I do this. Okay? I'll be like this. Okay? I'll be like this. Because I don't want to get confused. Okay? I'm trying to minimize the amount of confusion that we can help you with different places and CI. Okay? I'm a little time to get to minimize the yeah. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so we do this. So I'm going to actually enter this over the line data to.cfp. I have a fixed string that is factors. Okay. So I'm just going to call this. Um, I'm going to call this. Uh, okay. Okay. So there's the task. You remember that's what we typed in. Just two rows, two columns, two rows, okay. It's just sitting here now. So now what we do is we do the following. Say save. Uh, we do, we say save. Um, something. I'm not actually sure that I can do it. Uh, how do I create a. Uh, no, not an RDF file. It's a regular. It is, but it is a regular file. Okay. Save that file in the way you call this. I'm going to call this task.rdf. I mean, you know about the save file. Okay, the rest of you know when R, when you quit R, it says, Do you want to save your session? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's doing exactly this and saving all of the objects in your workspace into a, into a file and then dot capital R data. Okay, but you can do it by hand if you want, and then carefully select which one you want to see. Set save the command for this. Okay, there we go. Okay, so and now we get out of here. Okay, and now let's just do the following. Okay. These are the these are the list of, of files in my in my package description. Have to change. It's got the ints and all that stuff. We don't need that anymore, actually. But it's just sitting there. And then I have a data directory and a file called dash.rb. Now I'm going to go back over here and I'm going to scroll. Again, yeah, control our packages, dev tools, whatever it is that you want to actually control the package you have there. So thank you very much. Okay, and now I'm going to do one R and I'm going to say <coughs> library of R. I'm going to say data of multi-name dash. Okay, no error. That's always a good sign. Okay, okay, and then dash is there. We're done. Okay, that's the simplest way for us. That's just one thing. If you actually want to give somebody an R object that they can just use, if they don't have to type system or something like that, you just create the R objects in the data directory, and you have many things in the data directory. You have multiple R objects. You each has a set, each each one of them is in a separate RDA file, R data, or just the RDA term for R data. Okay, they're in they're in a separate file, and then somebody says data of dash. And now we ask this question, why do the two packages have a, a data for that? Okay, so now we just tell which one we want. Okay, so now we go back over and we say, hey, package equals file. Okay, and now we set in another one in James the file. Okay, and then that's the file. Okay, and now we've got this. Everyone happy? No, please, uh, Anything you want. I, I made a data frame because we had a data frame because we're dealing with different 
you can create any object you want as long as it can be saved and then restored. Okay. If you so if you save something, okay, so now we get into more fun stuff. If you save something which actually has a class or some structure that is defined as part of another package, well, that's perfectly fine. But then your package should make sure that, that other one's loaded. Okay, so you just you've got a dependency and your package on the other package. And it gets a little bit weird because, well, do I really need this? Do I really need this other package? No, we just don't need to use the data. So so you can but you can set up an arrangement for like, okay, when the data is loaded, we will load the other package. Okay, and yeah, so that, that's that's a good thing to do. But yeah, you, you generally you can have any object you want there that can be saved and restored. Okay, or serialized and deserialized. Okay. Yes, so if, for instance, like in the thing where it's like you're saving Dibble, you could write then into it when you need to install it. You could do to it. And so if I'm giving you that, and I've been working with Tibble, I can give you that and connect somehow a message to you that I've created. In your package, what I suggest, the simplest way to do it is in your package, you just have a dependency that says this package needs the type of person. Okay, and what you, and the way you would do that. Is to go to your description file. Okay, you go to this description file and you then say, oh, and by the way, this depends on the tiny version. Okay? Okay, and now the nice thing about this is you're basically saying, look, so I mean, two things depends on any force. Okay, but there are two different things, they are actually probably different, but important things. But this is basically, I'm going to use the ends here. Okay? Which is this thing is that I can have a comma separated list of packages. So, so I, if I depend on three things like the A, B, and C. And then basically what we've done here is we're basically saying R, when you install this package, don't install those two. Make sure they're installed. Okay, if you're there, there, don't install them. If they're not there, do install them. And then also because of the dependency here, when I say when I say library above, it says, oh by the way, you can actually go and load those packages into my object. Okay, at the same time. Okay, that's the simplest way to do it. We could get into conditionally uh, loading them only when an object is loaded. I don't worry about that. Stuff. Okay, just that, that's more advanced than me, but it's not that. Happy? Any other questions? I guess the data is too big to put on GitHub. If the data are too big to put on GitHub, uh, as I say, the simplest thing to do is just actually have it as a URL. Okay, and so we can download it. But then, as they go back to what we did, our initial premise was. I don't want to keep downloading this each and every time I run my code. So at least allow me to download it once and save it in my R, have it as a variable in my R session. Then the, your code should not go and reload it each and every time. But yeah, but first, if your data are confidential or if they're too big, then, um, then this, this isn't going to work. Okay, so, yeah, sorry. If you're it will work just fine, but you better not be putting it on um, RAM or something like that if it's too big. Okay, but there's no reason, even if you think our confidential, there's no reason why you can't make our package and share it with people who actually have access to that, who are allowed to see that data. This is a nice convenient thing. But otherwise, but the other thing is you should also use our package to create small data sets that are examples of both the visible here and to analyze that people can study that data, including yourself and test your code. And but then you can go off and download it remotely. That's just a whole different, it's a different set of criteria that depends on speed. Yeah. Any other thoughts, questions? Yeah. Um, so when you save the CSV as um, a dot or an EA, yeah. um, you essentially like double the size of the package. Hmm. Like you're sending, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like earlier on, you were, you were talking about how you were, you were frustrated by getting ginormous file sizes. This is very small. They're, they're, they're still very small. In fact, actually, the, what, what you'll find is that, um, uh, depending on exactly what you do, it may, you may, in theory, actually, if I have a file, and I'm going to take a, a really pathological case, if I have a file for some convenient, uh, you won't have a CSV file for 25,000 decimal places, a big number, I will 
and the name of the board being all capital names, it's all caps. Again, if you actually need any of the, uh, the buttons in our studio or packages like uh, functions like package.scale, existing package for creating a uh, package, it will do this for you and then just tweak it a little bit. If you have to tweak it a little bit, I like to understand how it works. I don't have to try to get confused. Okay, and what I'm actually going to do is say, I would like all of my users of this package to be able to see this function called tidy. That's the name of the function in that file or it's shut off. It's called tidy. I may have other functions in there that I don't want them to be able to call directly. This is the one I want them to see. It's the other one that may help with function, but that's it. Okay. Remember when we went over here, I said R, what is R, the library of R. I haven't I haven't installed the new version yet, so I did that. Okay. What, what is it? List all the names of the objects in the package that there are. Okay, so we just have to say the data directory. So now I want to install this guy. Okay. <coughs> So I install these packages that I'm installing a source package from Bob. It's got an R directory, a data directory, a loop directory, it's a pair of packages for labels that we're going to Okay, help, there are no help pages. Okay, uh, and somebody can put this like Okay, so you got, and then it says, go back, goes off, and it says, this is, you check to see that, you know, where, where did we get the error? I didn't get the message. Okay, now I type library of Bob. Everything happens. Look, what happened? It loads the fire for us because it was a dependency. Okay? That's actually not good news. But it's cooler news, if you will, <laughs> than not having it because they say, oh, it doesn't work because you can load the, the deep fire yourself. This is good. So we're, we're doing better. Okay? So now I actually look at the search path. So if we have Paul, it got loaded in number two, and then the deep fire actually got loaded after path. Okay? But if you do know that the fire actually really finds some of the work functions that are in base with him, now I am getting the wrong one. It's very bad. It's a lot of time. Okay, so that's fine. But now, if I, if I look at what's in there, there is my tidy function. Everyone happy? Now I've written an R package that has data and terms, and R function that is in me, and now you are a professional software developer. Okay? Okay? Okay, you can't focus on crown because you don't really help it. Okay, so it'd be nice to actually write help stuff in a way, but you don't need to write help to actually have a an R Okay, you need to fully functional, and that means the R is actually way down. Okay, it's very, it's very, it's a very useful way to do this. R command build this, send it to me, and off we go. You can either install it or put it down inside the tool. I just take a look at this tidy function, there it is. Everyone happy? Any questions? Okay. The next question is going to be this. How do I make this function a good and good one? This is not bad. Okay, so I can do that. Your base work, a mid work, not bad. It doesn't matter if it only takes for 15 minutes to make it faster. It runs in seconds and it won't work. That takes like 40 minutes and 50 minutes seconds and it won't. Okay, but I'm assuming it's going to get amortized over multiple users. What are it going to actually take so long that actually what we're going to do is important? So you can take a look at this. If I'm on the GitHub repository, take a look at it. Okay, we're going to take a break for um, 10 minutes. Okay, so we'll go to the bathroom for a minute. The rest of you are going to go to the bathroom and look ahead and try to figure out how you would make this faster. Okay, without looking at any of the code on the GitHub repository underneath that directory. Okay, because I have six versions. Okay, so we will make it incrementally faster. Okay, so 10 minutes and we'll and uh, uh we'll check. This is this is like this box package. I could 
created an R directory and I copy a file in that they, they gave me. But normally you actually then start creating instead of copying files in, you may already have the R functions lying around, but when you copy them in, all, nearly always going to start writing a new function into the package. So I, I open up the R directory uh, and uh, create a new, a, new, uh, a new file called foo, let's say. Okay. The name here, and then I'm going to create another uh, function that says, um, we call it a mega simple function. Okay, let's say next. Okay, and it's just you know, extremely boring. Okay, it's uh, next. Okay, it's just, it just, it just discards all of the, um, the, the, the non negative, negative symbols. Okay, so press it, it doesn't matter what function it is. Okay. Now, but I, I'm going to create that. Okay, right over here. Okay. So this is this is the this is my directory that I have the namespace. Okay. The total files are my backups that my editor makes for my editor. Ignore those. All will ignore them. So I'm going to close because it's not actually saying part of the Okay, so I have this, but now I have two files the, in the R directory, the original R, and I have one called R. Okay, and what I do now is I control this package, turn up, there it is, okay, it works still. Okay. And now I say library of R, that's great. And now I say R, R, uh, I say, show me the tidy function. Okay, that this tidy is coming from R. Okay, okay. and it's this. It actually says I'm in bubble. Okay, so you can see it's bubble. Okay, where it's where it's at. Okay. Now if I try to find a simple package, my simple function, it says I have no idea what you're talking about. And the reason for that is because it is defined in bar, but I didn't say that I want to do this. Okay, I said, you know, that's just an insurance function that I do my call and all this. So what I can if I want is to use the full form. I mean, let me see. Okay, and this says this says bypass the interface, bypass the actual what uh, what is publicly visible to go into that. Okay, and I can I can find that there. So there's my function. If I want to, so I I now got two files. I've got two functions defined in the package. One of them is visible, I think the other one is not. But if I wanted to, I would go over to namespace here. And I can say okay, now it's export the system. Okay, and now when I install this package again and load it, I'll see something. Okay, so the namespace is filtering what uh, what symbols, what variables are actually visible to you once you load the package. Okay, so I can put multiple files, uh, multiple files in the R directory, multiple files, and they can find whatever they want. What actually has happened is the following: what R does is it. It looks at your R directory and it lists all files using list.files. Okay. And then it sorts it all in a particular order, which sometimes can be bad news. Okay. In which case, I mean, tell it what order to put in. Okay. But it, 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 it sources them and you will hopefully you all know the source function. It just literally runs, it reads the contents of an R file that it's going to read in. Okay, and runs into line of code, and then it leaves the deep defined function, you get variable name. And then having sourced all the files, it says save this to an R new file. So it takes all the objects that you find at the end and then saves them to, to, a, uh, to a file and arranges to that be loaded on the package from Okay, so we would see the two things. The namespace then actually says the other way filter that arrange them into two groups, the visible ones and the invisible. So that's all that's actually happening. So you can emulate what a package does by actually just sourcing all the files um, yourself. Okay, but our slightly smart, it does it in the right order. It can be done alphabetically. There's alphabet that it needs. The one on the sheet. Not the one. Okay, that's why sometimes the order is different when you actually take that from the Chinese computer. Okay, so in which case, sometimes you have to actually say that the order matters because one file. Contains code that the other one is in one. So that's a problem. Most times I 
it doesn't have to be because it's like function definition, but there are higher functions that you want to get set. Okay, what happened? Yeah. So, can you do anything with enough source of simple material for it? Um, so, enough source is that the function that you have to set up with where that you can't, uh, if, you, if the support is simple, I can see it. If I don't, then what we're basically saying is this may change. Okay, this is not something that the end user should rely on. I may remove it as a package developer or author. I may remove this file. I may remember, I may remove that function. I may change the behavior entirely. I may take, it now may require three arguments, not one. And I may just discard all the errors. So you shouldn't rely on it. But if you want, you could go and get it with this free code. Okay. But you're taking your you're playing the file. Okay, because I'm literally the next person I sent you. <clears throat> okay, so don't distract me. Yes. Two columns, two, three columns says, I don't care that maybe one of you can see this, so you let me see it. The two column says, only show me things that were intended to be seen. So in fact, you never need them because you just say, I just I type it, I show you the type. But the double column is nice because remember, the double column does have a purpose for saying, let's go back over here. Uh, okay. Very off. That's what happens. Okay. It says I'm loading the dplyr package. And by the way, you should know that the dplyr package overrides the defined filter and lag, which are actually uh, in package based. And I so you know I don't want you to define that. I want to call the lag function, for example, for the one in base. Well, how do I do that? I don't. The simple answer is I can't do it directly. If I just type lag, it goes hey. Get the one from require. But if I do now follow, which is base of double column, I say lag. Now, this one will be that that now allows them to access the selected. So the double colon is actually very helpful. Some people use it a lot in their code to, to, to make it clear so it's easier to read and it's a double qualifier. It kind of gets annoying if you actually have you know, double code the package name double colon everywhere. That means it's by the complicated text. And on the well in terms of actually specificity it's good because this is really annoying. If if you if uh, if I had the fire if I have, um, if I manage to, uh, if I if I had loaded the package, and then I'd actually then load the stack package, stack would be in front of the file as things would happen. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's what we need to avoid. Because now it really will depend on what happens when you load a package. Some annoying person says your package doesn't work. You go like, what do I do? Okay, we have no idea, and then it all depends on what they've done in the last session beforehand. Mm -hmm. It couldn't be done from I did. I'm sure that the code is important and it is really important because we should follow that. So, so we have to guard against it. And again, this is good practice. So instead of this guy here, okay, get rid of this guy, we still need to find that code needs to be So let's get rid of this guy. Okay, let's get rid of this actually change it from import that tend to imports. Okay, that's one step. Do one more step in the other. So the pen does two things best. So when we put the pen colon on these packages, it says when you install this package, please also install these files. When you load this package, also load the file. Okay, and that's good. So it's very handy. Okay, but the, but the trouble is it changes our search path, it changes how interactively we find the function. Imports is different. We say, I still need this guy. Still need to be fired. But I'm also going to do the following. I'm going to say import be fired. This is in my namespace file. I say I still want to export the functions that I wish, but I want you to import into this package all the be fired functions so I can 
the first one, you have to have a fourth prior level L1. Okay. So this is going to clean things up with so it's not going to depend on the search path as the time applies them, but it's also not going to change the search path. Now I'm going to be able to move back over here. This is just the only one we did in the first step. We had on that this is one position that we're going to go and change it. So if we're installing this, okay, library is bottom. Before I do that, let's just look at the search path. Okay, now library is bottom. I didn't get any messages about the supply cost. I'm masking those guys here. Okay, no problem. Okay, and now if I resolve it, so now I can insert the search path again. Sure enough, I didn't get a message that's required because it's not in the search path. Okay, so that's good. So no help. I can prove this here if you want, but uh, yeah, I would get fighting here too. There's these are the functions that I export. These functions will see the required data of those functions. Okay. A nodes will look along the require, not along the search path. But as I said, import required is this package. So there's no ambiguity here that my code in this package will actually see the right language and replace the function. But the require not in that. These are no steps. Even though my stats, if that is in my first time, okay, my code will see the right thing. How would actually work? The way you actually verify this is by using some of the tools. I'll give you how to know what and you'll get there. Okay, but you can actually go in and say, let's stop in one of these functions and then say, find me the require, find me the latter function and tell me which one it is, and you can actually <coughs> take a look at it. Okay, and, and that's good. And debugging is just one way of the uh, uh, important way of verifying. Okay, so that's the namespace file. Okay, so we're going to export things. Uh, you don't have to export everything. You can use pattern matches if you want, but they export everything in regards to the page. Okay, so if you've got 100. Functions will get in the way of writing the last couple of summaries. By the time you're using the function, it's writing the only one. Yeah. Uh, you have a separate class in the new container. So, is it actually installed with whatever it is for the dependency, or do you just look at the local changes that have been installed in it? So, for the depend in your, in your description file, you can either depend or enforce it. You should always be important and let you know really good reason to use that. Okay? 21 cases, 21 situations where you actually want to use Okay, so you should always be forced to use it. Okay? One, but I don't, in either case, import the depends. When you install, when you say install this, when you use install dot packages on the R command line, you say install this package, R will go off and actually search for those components. Any package mentioned in the import or the depend field, if they do you have those? Yes, you do, then I won't install that one. No, you don't. I will install that one. Okay, it goes off. You can control it, you can tell it not to, but you can do what you don't do with the rest of the So want these other packages. Okay, um, but yeah, so it'll go off and actually find the dependencies, go retrieve the ones that it needs, and then okay. And by the way, in the dependencies, for the import statement, you can actually say, I want to require from 1.5 version 1.6 or higher. Okay, in which case, I will say, I have 1.5 in 1.6, I will install 1.6 for you so you can have the statements. This is important because some, especially some of the time version changes. Uh, okay, then I need to be on a map version or higher because if you've got an old version, you don't want to. Okay, yes. Thank you. Import. Uh... You can always use double colon to say, hey, there you go. Okay? And the double colon doesn't require the package to be in your search path. You don't have to say library, you have to say that double colon lag, and you'll go find it without having it in the search path. Okay? Um, okay, any other questions? Yes. What's the R storage dot R and the P dot R file? 
Yeah. Uh, so is that the same R? Um, it's, it's just any R code. There's this, this is the screw.r. Okay. Okay. This is screw.r. Uh, and it's just regular R code. I could put anything I want in there. Okay. Any code I can say x equals one to n. Okay. But I we nearly always put R function in there. And then sometimes I can a few a few constants that we know that way. Okay. So you can keep those like and then in the tiny R, we have another function. They are just any R codes. In this particular case, we take a look at this function. It's mostly based on until you get down to here, which is uh, we're using some of the tiny R's. So it means that it means it means it has a dependency on the metal packet. Okay, that, that answer your question. So the function itself is in the dot R file, but then in namespace, you tell it that you want to see it. I want to see it. So you say it's export this these, these functions. And I, I said export export title, and I have another line that says export simple. I could have said export title concept. Yeah, there's different ways of doing it. Yeah, it's different. We want to have the running quotes around it. No, you can use quotes, you don't have to use quotes. It's pretty flexible. It's about how to run Yeah. So, so the namespace is just literally just filter what you can see. Directory access and the R directory is just a regular R code. Okay. okay, so as I say, I'm more than happy to answer lots of questions about technical material, but it's also an element of problem. After 25 years of writing code, I have a different pattern. I went to the press release for the way of writing code. Uh, just by like, um, but uh, I'll show you. Too. Um, but it's, it, it is a style, it is a thought process that goes into writing the development of the thing, but thinking ahead about how to make code extensible, how to make it flexible, customizable, okay, um, and you're, you're trying to actually uh, anticipate that. Okay, so we'll talk about that over the next couple of days. But feel free to ask me other technical questions too. But before we get into this a little bit, is um, I'll, I'll, I'll mix it in as we go along, but let's actually do some code here. Okay, so what are the actual questions? So tell me how, tell me good and bad things about this code. Let's focus on the next. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's got nothing to do with the one. It's got nothing. No, I, I, I mentioned that uh, I think somewhere along the way when we actually announced this. Workshop, I said, if you have code, would you want me to make it go faster or better or whatever to extend it to you? And there we go, one out of there. Okay, uh, and so I like I like working on these things. I like real case studies as opposed to something I make up and then it's easy. If you have something, let me know. The benefit is actually if this if this code matters to you, well, at the end of, at the end of the day, I have fun to do with it. You get a code, you get a code that in this case is 400 times faster. Okay, so that's kind of my like, thing. Should put up with a little bit of it. So it's fine. Like, I'm going to put up uh, my old boss and see that I'll give that an answer. I'm actually going to the credit where you barrels to show you what code is like. Okay, just, just, just share, just show, show that's how you learn. Okay, and uh, I learned lots of things like that. So let's just take a quick look at this. What pray tell is a bad thing? How can we improve this code? Okay, and just put just some, some, some tips for this. And by the way, you're not allowed to look at my comments. Yep. Can you say, what is the repetitive rule? Okay, so repetitive. What's repetitive? Um, I mean, well, I mean, like this part, like the intention of the is to define the value of the very last value of the second last value of the second part, but I'm not sure what it's like to do. It's just converting the value. Well, so one of the things is that there's spikes. Oh, okay. And there it is actually new. So you have to be careful that. So it's hard. One of the things we're actually doing is we can use the tool. You can actually write an algorithm. You can actually write tools to analyze the tool. Okay? So we're building out a bunch of the rest Lots of coins on, you know, so you can actually programmatically query it if it isn't ever used. Okay, 
Okay, this guy here, for example, ain't moving. So why are we why are we why are we polluting like the that you can do that in that state of studies? Here it doesn't have to be perfect on the legend. There we go. But it's also the key that So it's a bad move. But there was a reason that one thing used the fun font has to play. That and then it gets left over. So it's kind of nice to go through an editor program. So you have to code review and figure out what 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 can you get a chance? How do we make the code better? And this is like literally just going back and editing the text, you know, let's let's tidy this up. Um, but there are there are uh, there are analysis uh, functions. But go on. So, site is used, it's hard to read, but then it's not that the code is complicated. Also, the more we can actually say, well, that was obvious here for you, then we might actually find it. So, you said site what has been used, it is being used down here. This guy ain't being used, but it's hard to see because it is also one of those cases where uh, this is in pretty good shape. So. That you see the spaces around the actual comic, so the spaces and between the operator and the time and lines, which makes it easier to read. Okay, computer couldn't do that. Okay, as long as it's syntactically correct, but as humans, we do care. It's all the old help you can actually get to look to read this stuff. And I like what this even formatting of this line is on for a long time. I might change this to the matrix. Here's the, here's the values that I want to use to spell. Here's the number of codes. I might put this on another column, another row, and mm -hmm. the number of columns, and then the and then other row. So I can easily see which bit is which. Hard to actually scan this for stuff. Mm -hmm. What about this C here? Okay. This, well, this is the this is kind of happening when you read the two guys together. Okay, okay. they can use two vectors. But I'm going to assume that that cat that cat is a data frame or list. I don't know. Okay, it's nice if we jump into the data. That's fine. Okay, but we just had to start with that and then end up. And again, you can you can easily criticize that all these with this concept because this is the art. This is called person who writes the code. Writing it himself, they know exactly what's going on. But then the second time to do it, it's like I don't even know who this is going to be. But it's pretty helpful, but it's not that we don't want to get hung up on that. But this is actually concatenated. Let's just say that catch is a data frame that's got uh, 200 people in the conversation. Okay? So this is got 250 million observations and 250 million observations that are clicking off like that. Okay. And I'm concatenating them into a vector and then computing the min. But they don't need to concatenate them into a vector because the min, if you take a look at this, you said cavalier is about 200 um, million. Okay. So if you take a look at the min function, it's got dot, dot, dot. It actually says you can do this any number of arguments. Okay, so if I say what is the minimum of one to ten and uh, twenty and twenty-five? Okay, it says I will I will look through and compute the minimum of all of these and if they were concatenated together. You don't have to concatenate them together. So this will actually save the memory in the case where we actually have to be, where, where there's a lot of data. And this so it just behaves itself. Correctly. Okay, so the dot 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 here is very helpful. Does this matter as much? Yes, in general, but not in the specific case. Let's not get hung up on my question. Yeah, and along a similar line, we're looking both somewhat hard for me to like know exactly what's going on, but it looks like a lot of them are being created to objects that are like then intermediate steps to the object that you actually want. Yeah. At the end, and if we can not save those things to the object along the way, we might save the memory. Um, I could go and I have been known to do things, so basically, we can do that problem through. Because what we can do is sometimes do is we can do a big temp. Okay, thanks. We can actually say temp equals a cause of function, and two. Is equal, uh, is equal to um, g of 10, that's 10 to 2, okay, and then 10 to 3 is equal to h of 10 to 2, 
and then you say, okay, fine, now this is the rule of return and plus one. And this is these are all intermediate down in the case. You're telling me that we could do this. In that gets rid of all those intermediate variables. Now, I've intentionally done these with one that are function length, but I have no arguments, if you will. Okay. But boy, when they start getting lots of arguments, this becomes one line of somebody comes out of the dark content of that. That's probably the single worst result in our So you can use pipes. One of the real problems about it, one of the real problems about about gradient is I kid you not, I'm pretty good at this language, but I don't like doing it. The reason I don't like doing it is I make mistakes all the time. Okay, I need to look at the values and check that they are correct. So it isn't, so, and then when I've got the code running, then I can start doing good stuff. But in general, I do need to check that these guys are what they think they are. So I have to unravel this code and make a side note in there. So it's not a bad thing to get some green and blue and development purposes. See, the, the pipes are fine. If you look at this code, the pipes are there. They are the stuff we saw. So you can actually get around to doing this sort of stuff. Um, so here we are avoiding uh, intermediate variables, and that's fine. Uh, so, so you can use the pipes if you want. They, they, they have issues. And the other thing we can actually do if you want is that, okay, fine, we start putting in code like this and to remove the temp. Okay, and then we remove the temp too here as well after we use it. It's, it starts getting a little annoying because it makes the code more verbose. Um, the compiler. There's a compiler in R and uh, in the code out. You, uh, it's easy for us to actually go in and inject this code. So that's the first thing. Give us your code and we look at it for you. And then remark, we want that this is an issue. For the most part, it's not a huge issue. But so but we are giving up readability for, um, for saving memory. There's a, there's a famous uh, phrase which basically says, you know, uh, optimizing your code for memory or screen is premature optimization for readability. Do not get your code, do not write your code to be fast. Write your code to be correct, and then write your code to be fast. Okay, how many banks the version of correct would be small. So there's another nice phrase which is that, um, which is debugging is really hard. Okay, it's twice as hard as writing code. So if you write the code to the best of your ability, by definition, you can't see that. Okay, because it's twice as hard. Okay, and the problem is. You can outsmart yourself by writing really clever code that you can't understand. You can't read it that. That's also part of the problem with Okay, so you have to use non standard evaluation. You can't do that. If you say you can read that R code, it's two separate languages. It doesn't look like the same language, and it's not. But the rule is different. Um, so I'm not going to be very, very confused. Okay, but so intermediate variables is the nice part of that, but I, I don't know what the problem is here. It's speed of the issue for us, not memory. Okay, yep. It's just a clarifying question if an object's created inside a function and it's not returned by that function, isn't it automatically fixed at one point? It will get garbage collected at the end of the function, but not but if, 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 if this thing here is terabytes big. And then this is another terabyte big. We won't actually clean them up until we finish all of them. If I need to clean this one out, at least, uh, you know, I, I create this one, then we can kind of clear this one. I may need to actually manually yeah, control it when they get cleaned up. Yes, yeah. once you call a function, uh, everything gets cleaned up afterwards, except for the return value. Okay, yeah, okay, so that's the value. Okay, anything else? Type your mind, by the way. Type your mind. Are you not at square? There's another review that says for every line of code is a beat. Okay. And if you care about debugging, I'm just showing you this and I showed you these guys on the today or on Wednesday. 
again, debugging. I might not have debugged, so I, I, I can reason about the code, that's great. I can't reason about the code, I don't really then the problem. But when you start putting dots in here because it's not the first argument, it starts getting more complicated. Now you have to test it. I have to actually define this that the stack frame, the call stack. So we call we call new file. When you look at what's getting called, you can see that we have one of our functions that call and one function that call because it's doing an awful lot of these functions, so it becomes very, very complicated. So I set up a very simple example yesterday to show some example and the error message shows me the But I cannot find the very, I cannot find the very of the message, and I can't find the follow inside the data frame. So the error message is in there cryptic now, so it becomes even more complicated. So that so that because it's in two different evaluation models. That's fine, you can you know, use whatever you want, but it's the mixing two languages.
before we replace by an L ploy or an S ploy, okay, it's not actually very much different. You can actually, there are times when it's probably not a good time to have a skill. So that's not what I actually care for you on. This is, so what's the thing? Not because I, I, I also, there's also a real trick to this. If you're actually, um, again, speaking for everybody, I know the rest, I know, I know all of you actually have to do this job and make this work. If you're just supposed to do this project, it's not a problem to do. Um, the, uh, it's nice to convenient to work with. Okay, it's nothing else to think that you can actually figure out whether it's not. If you're, if you're, if you're a piece of content on this, it's kind of nice if you actually know it's reliable. So you can, you can, you know, or you can steal ideas out of it and you can adapt it to your own stuff. So when I, when I looked at this, I want to say this, I see this. I just, I didn't hold that. I don't know what that is. I don't care what that is. I can make it go out of it. Okay, this is kind of weird and stupid, and I'm mean, much better off with this than I was. It's hard, it's hard. So I finally figured out this, but please correct me if I'm not. I said, basically, what's going to do is it's going to actually, uh, it's going to actually, so let's think, figure out, but how to, how, to, how to read code or how to learn what code does without reading, but actually walking through and watching to see what it does and then inferring kind of what it what, what it is. And it, 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 uh, um, so what it does is it, it takes in a data frame like this, okay? So it's got it's got uh, a column here. It take you take a row here and basically you have a yeah, correct me wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, basically what it is. We're basically doing the following. Okay. We're taking the start depth to a row. Okay, we've got a column called start depth and another one called end depth. Now we're taking X as the row number, okay? X is in one through then row. Okay, by the way, it's all here. What happens if catch is empty? What happens if there's no authorization? Bam? What do you mean, bam? Will I get an answer? It's really entertaining. It's certainly not going to do what I want it to do. Okay? One through n row cat would be one column zero. So n row cat would be zero. So one column zero is a vector of length two between the number one and zero. So it will move twice. The first time it will go over to position one and then go and get the first element of this vector, which will be a new and an A. So it will be Okay? Okay, so that's fine. That's not what we want to be on an A. And then the next one is a zero, which means we've actually subtracted the zero value for C and L1. So we we'll just continue on those cases. So we will end up actually doing the process in one row. That doesn't mean good. This is bad news. So we need to, for, for now, who on earth is calling the function? Just now we talk to this. The person who calls this function having done the previous command that is in another function and they don't fit in that with the original operation. They will filter and everything down, hitting everything that's happening on uh, Wednesday in the time, but the long Wednesday they will leave this in. So we have to be a little bit careful. But we're writing more than one stuff. Okay, we have to go through the second. So this should actually be that uh, we should actually use seek along, okay, or seek to execute the sequence. And as I say, I think actually can be the case for the program again. Okay, so the better way to do this is to handle those pathological cases, which do our own. Okay, we grab this thing, we compute, we compute the middle of the, the start and the end, jet. And then, as far as I'm aware, we then basically sort of suppose we end up with five, okay? Then we end up with this one row of cash will generate five rows of new data. Is that correct? Let's see. Uh, is it, uh, no, we're just figuring out which is deeper. Start at the end of that. Yes, but then it's like, <coughs> then you want to repeat. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, just leaving ahead, what's going to happen is we take this, so we got a number here, which is seven, and we got another, another number. Okay, and then get well, for this row, we are going to actually construct something that actually has five rows. Okay, I'm going to create for every row in my original data frame, I'm going to create a new data frame with, with multiple rows, and then I'm going to stack them all together on top of each other. Okay, I'm going to combine them like this. Okay, and then I end up with one massive data frame. Okay. So each row will potentially give me multiple rows in the new process. 
also each row in the input that we want to do on that. Now that should help you figure out how many is going to pass. Okay. So what we're doing here is this. Emacs, we figure out how many rows we can do. We take the deeper and the shallower, okay? Let's take the maximum then, okay, of these two numbers. So now, and then basically we compute deeper minus shallow across the one. This is the bigger one, this is the smaller one. So it's the difference between seven and 12, okay, plus one is the difference that's correct. And then we repeat this guy. So how am I gonna make this go faster? That's the first thing I do. I get rid of the four that go on together and put them in. Do the actual one. Let's see if I can play this one together. Why are you? What's Pmax? Pmax is just the number of rows. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, there is one. Don't seem to have that in many of Just go. Okay? So we can get rid of this because there's a lot of work going into set up. Oh, we do that. We can work through a whole lot of different stuff. But there's only scalar values and you will individual values because we're working one row at a time. So we could actually just compute P max as max. Okay? And the same with PM. There are good reasons for using P max and PM. If I remember correctly, the way I need to go faster is to bring it back in again. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to scroll away and then we're going to bring it back in. Okay, okay, but, but again, one set of time. If you happen to be able to just leap in and figure out how to do this, then, then you write your code perfectly the first time it's really fast and it's not a problem. But it's really interesting that you're not that. Okay, and I'm going to figure it out which bits are taking the time. Hang on a second, I've got two numbers. This number and this number, and I can choose the max, and then I can choose the end. <laughs> that way, the range. Just get the range, or just sort them. Because <laughs> there's only two, and I know that if I sort them, the small one's going first, and then the big small one's second. <laughs> okay, and then I can do that. So I can just, I can just sort, sort these two numbers. Instead of two functions, or I get one function. By the way, they're both sort of essentially. They're both. The max is up to the min, it's going through and finding out which one's in. We have access to do the max, so do the same thing as for the and then do it. So I can actually get down to one function. The one function called. Now the thing about this is these loops are really expensive. Okay, why? Because unlike other languages, this coarse little r is not learned from previous experiences. Okay. First time around, you actually have to go and find p max along your search path. They are in the important section right now. Okay, then the next time around, it's because I don't know, you may have changed it. So yeah. it starts looking all over again to the search path or to the input. So it's very, very interesting now. There's ways to make it, there's ways to make it smarter if you're actually writing a package and other good things that are in the package too. It means it doesn't look more in your search path, but faster. And secondly, you don't need to compile the code um, and it's just it go, go solve this pretty fast now. So I'm not just saying so. You can improve that, okay? But that's good. Then we do a data frame. So now, so we basically have figured out how many rows do I need, and then we repeat, we, re we repeat this on this value that many times. Then, so we basically just fill in this out. So we, so again, this value here is let's say a, and then we get an a, 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 a five a's right down, and that's fine. So that's just repeating. And the next step is this. So then we, so we create the new data frame for this one row, and then we are bind it, row bind, with the current, with the previous result, we've got the results from the previous iteration. Okay, and then we print it. This is always difficult to do. This is very unstable. <laughs> so doing something and we both die. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay, so uh, when I, so one of the things I do with this is, that actually is very slow. The printing is very slow. So, so we, we so I do is I would do something like follows. If verbose, 
when I go back up on the right side of the right side of the Okay. And now I'm adding arguments to this. I'm adding parameters of the color and stuff like that. Each one of them. Okay, on every single, I got 200,000 lines in my operations in my data plan. I do not want 200,000 um, copies of this data plan going flying by. It's taking up more time to print and print it out. So for me, I'm going to just not do that. Okay, the other thing, okay, so this is just a nice thing to add. You need to do something like Skin option, you can allow the person to set the mm -hmm. option if the person is bigger to set it globally. You see, another thing you can actually do is you might just might do something like this, which is it promotes and x modular 100. Okay. It print out every 100 points. Okay, so we basically say if, if dividing by 100 equals zero, okay. 100, 200, 300, 400, you'll print. 101, 102, 101. This is just a nice thing. Still saying unallowed, okay, but it's not skewing out a whole lot of that. So, a lot of the problems are going to be great. We are looking for some output, and so we have to get very involved with the verbal and all the verbs. We have to be careful to print only the things we actually manage to understand. So, these are, these are useful for hidden. Anyone want to tell me what's going on here about the mic? Yeah, going back. Sorry. Sorry. Yes, yeah, so so initialize is empty and then um our bind or add a new row to the empty is no, so that is being initialized as a uh as a respected kind of row. So this is in any language this is super. Okay, we get this is, I'll show you some I'll, I'll run this, not this one, I'll show you a simple example if you if you don't believe me. But basically the uh as, as you, you can consider see what's happening is let's suppose we let's suppose that our catch has um you know, let's say it has a thousand rows. Okay, for each so for each row we construct a, a, a new data frame. So when we get to 999, we finished row 999. Let's suppose all of them have generate five rows. Okay, so, we, so what we're actually going to get here in this tiny data is 999 times five rows in my in my and then I get a new one with five more rows in the last diagram. Okay, the very last diagram. What actually has to happen? If I take a big data frame, I take a data frame that is basically five times 999, and I need another one which is five times 1,000. So I have to create, I now have two of those of essentially the same data, and I have to allocate this one, I have to maintain this one in memory, and then I have to copy everything over to save time. Okay, and I'm doing that for so basically I'm, I'm every every iteration round I'm having the previous one, a copy of the previous one plus a little bit, and then I have to copy everything in that previous one. Okay, you want to avoid that. Okay, so in any language, it is that ideally, in my case, I think I've made a very simple assumption that each of these has five rows, and by, if that were true. I would say take that number of rows in catch, multiply by five, and I would pre allocate the space. And so the trouble is, I don't know how many rows I'm going to generate in each iteration. This is bad news. It's a much better idea. <laughs> Just can't do it. What can Do a very large number. What? Do a very large number. Do a very large number. Start with a number. How big? Five times. And five times the end of the catch five. Okay, and now I'm close by one. But I have to add in all the code that says if I don't have enough, make it bigger. And so it's now getting a little bit more than one. Okay, so I, I'm actually it's not this is actually how we do it in C code because we don't know it's so long. So actually we have to not be uh, this is so slow. But but this is beginning to lead us to the more and more efficient solution. Again, slightly wandering away too. I'm hoping that as we talk about this, you'll sort of see 
Like if that's a way of creating that out there. But it's oh, it is definitely the right thing. If we knew how many rooms there were going to be at the end, the R buying would be much faster. Okay, because R buying would basically sort of say, each time around would say, combine this with this, and then the next time would say, combine this with this. Whereas if we can sort of say, look, we've got 100 of these, go through, how many rows there are in each, sum them all together, and then do it all in one big go, that would be much better. So now we've got the answer to a problem. Not the best answer at all, but a good answer is going to get us an answer of five or six two rooms. Which is what? I'd like this. Actually, we got the counter, but that X is X most of the way rows, and that we got the counter. But I need to do a few more. Um, figure out what the absolute minimum depth is and the absolute maximum depth is. Which is the widest range you could possibly have. That's multiply it. the total number of rows by that maximum range. That's what it's like. I think that's Ellie's idea of pre out of the box. Pick a big number. So you can be more intelligent than just pick a random big number. You can know, open a big number that's actually big. Then we're going to have to shrink it down later on for that. I don't want to write code for that. I'm not even interested in this. But I, so what I've been told you is. is I just I'm making that one tiny change. Should you put them in a list and then unlist the list of them? Unlist the list. Mm -hmm. I don't want to unlist the list because that's just going that's going to have to be more work. That's not bad. Okay. So, but yeah. lists can be different. They can be a little bit annoying. You know, that's, different sizes. We can. So let's stop. Let's let's parse what you just said. Can you put? These into a list essentially. Each yeah. step for each data frame that I do separately, I put those in a list. That's one question. Yes. And the other question is, and then how do I put them into the data frame that I want? Which is a different question. I don't want to list too much because that, that, that's going to actually burn a lot of memory. I'm going to be a lot more in time. I don't know why I'm going to have to think about it. So actually, I'm just going to the right order. So that's not think hard. Let's just do something very really simple. Okay. Let's just suppose. That I had instead of saying instead of accumulating the current current result, this guy with with all the previous results, let's just let's just hold them around in the list. Okay, just keep them around. In other words, let's do the following. Let's do let's do something like the following. Let's do this all the dishes. This dish. Okay. Okay. I, we have a set of three details here. So let's let's move the R line outside the list. Okay. With me. That will work because now the R line, like min, is smart enough to say, oh, it gives me a hundred things combined together, a thousand things combined together. I'm going to sweep through, figure out how many rows there are in each of them, pre-allocate the space, and then copy the pieces in one at the whole. Let me do all the rows. Okay, not each iteration around. I'm going to get pairs the previous one and the current one. I'm going to actually do all of them at the end. This is vectorization. Okay, it says do them all in one go. So, now, so what we actually want to do is something that looks like this. So, what, what we could do is something that looks like the following. Okay, so we'll just say, say, we'll just say results of x equals. Um, this this fish, okay. Okay. We'll just do this, and then we'll just we'll pick this up and deliver it here. Again, I do. I'm just typing quite to the spirit of this. I'll show you the code if you want. Maybe you can go more. Uh, ask me lots of questions. So I told us I haven't defined results. So let's do that. Results equal. I can do something like this, which is I'm going to say the list. Okay, so that gives me a list. This guy is now just thinking X is none of the low numbers. So, so number one says the result, the first one is the result gets this. Round we go, number two gets the, gets the current result, and life is good. So, this is actually something I have to do quite frequently in R, and I've found that I need to use new call. Yes. Um, to R by now, it's the list. Can you talk about that? I don't know why. I will. I'm just getting there. I, 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 I love that insight just, just quite yet. Okay. I absolutely do. Okay. So, but before we get to do that call, we, we just agreed because what Emily said was a, a broken a few things. Which is, let's get a list of these guys and not try to combine them in iteration three. 
and just hold them around. Okay, then, that, then let's solve the problem how we combine them. The unlist or something else. I said R by and stuff like that. That won't work. Okay, but that's the second. So these are two separate constraints. So let's just figure out the first constraint. How do I get these into a list where they're just loose objects? Right? They're ordered. I need them to be in the right order. I need to have them all in one spot, in one variable. But I want to I want to put them into a list. It's very easy. You just create an empty list and then keep shoving into the ninth element, the next element. Okay, one, two, three. Yeah, everyone happy? Okay, you weren't listening to what I said. <laughs> okay, because exactly the same problems as we had before. I have an empty list and I think we can use the first element that seems to have to grow. Then when I get to the 999th one, I have to grow again. So we don't want to do that, do we? What? So what do I do? So again, what do I do? What bit here do I change? You just tell R how big the list should be. I pre allocate the list because I know how many rows there are. How many elements? It's the number of rows in catch. So, so I have to pre allocate. It's kind of funny. It's like, oh, it's not all hard work. Oh, look, if I just move around to the list now, so let me go and do exactly the same stupid thing I'm doing like another stupid thing. Another stupid way. Okay. So, whenever you see this, we actually all want to do this over here. Okay. So, we're just doing it. By the way, okay, this is this is the first one. We're not doing much now. Okay, so but but, but this is important. So not all the problems can be solved in the way I'm going to solve this one. But um, here we go. Okay, so this so that's bad because we were saying it can be at augmented by one, augmented by one, augmented by one. We keep adding it, adding it all the thing onto it. Okay, that's bad news. This is much this is much better because now we're basically saying, hey, we've got a thousand spots. Go in and fill them in one at a time, but you don't have to you don't have to change the, you don't have to create a new one. Am I happy? This is good. Now we get down to this thing. So what you really want to do is this our line of results one, okay, two. Okay. Results. I don't know how many it is. I can't type in a fact because it's not fast. Can't do that either. Okay, I can't do that because it because I know that then if I put an end row catch here that says one, two, end row catch in the normal return, four, six, 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 six. So I tell me what to do now. I want the computer to do this once to actually write the layout. I want to pass in each of these as an argument. So I need I need there to be this many arguments to R by just for just for fun. There is the R by function that takes dot dot dot. So the first argument and the second argument, it's not the min and max, you can see that any number of arguments are things. And it says I'll I'll do it all for you. And it's smart, like in it doesn't contaminate the course. It actually just figures out the smart way of doing it, and then it does the opposite of the problem. So we need to type in results one, results two, results three. So that's fine. We do we, we type this, but we can't. We just an update to say this is a thousand nine hundred and ninety nine or whatever. So what we need to do is well, we can do all sorts of random things. We can do some really really minimal stuff. Okay, but all we do is what we're just talking about. We do that, which says do exactly this. It's do that call basically says, so here's a simple example of do that call. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a function that takes A and B. Okay. And I'm Returns a plus b. Okay, so f of one and n gives me back a letter. That's fine. But now if I do the following: do dot call of f is a list that takes one and n. Okay, I still get back a letter. Okay, I'm basically saying take this list of arguments 
This is the first argument, this is the second argument. And call f, I choose my type f of one and f. Okay? So now imagine that this is a very long list. It still will have an argument. Each element will be an argument to f. Now, because our line is dot dot dot, each in my, in my world up here, this is basically saying that each element will go and will be able to connect an argument to our line. So I will get as many arguments to our line as there are elements in my list. Result. Make sense? It's, this is this is weird. This is a function. Uh, this is a funny. They're unfortunately a problem. Just by the way, just for um, some people, some people will remember things if you explain why they are the way they are. Somebody does. We have a long time ago. Why T of Y? We call T of Y. And this is really neat. Book on Bernard's R. After 20 years of job reading, R is still not going to be T of Y. It is basically easier to understand. T of Y is a big one. Okay, so I think that's the big one. Likewise, if I was to create an integer vector, I believe in my phone, but it's not connected. <laughs> integer of 10 does not, does not give me an integer with the value of 10, it gives me a vector of 10 integers. Okay, everyone happy? So, what does the list of 10 give me? Hmm? By the way, you can tell the <laughs> Okay? It gives me exactly what it should give me, which is a list containing the number 10. So, I have a problem. What? I can't construct a list with 10 empty elements. So I need to do this. I need another mechanism. Otherwise, I could not actually construct a list that contains the value 10. I mean, it's only the elements. Oh, so we say vector of the type and then the length of it. And if you wanted to, and again, because I like to learn only one thing, I can do something like the following. And now I can replace it. This is O. This is o. Okay, now you're learning all the different things that you can add. This is the general universal stuff. So give me a give me a, a multi-element thing. Here's the type and here's the number of elements I want to be out of. Okay, so this, that's why we have to do it like this because we can't copy this as well. So we just don't want to do that. Again, why? Because this is and it's not we can do if you were to look at the pattern integral of 10, numerical 10, logical of 10. Oh, this is kind of work. So what happened? Why is calling R by a thousand times more efficient than calling a list once? Because they will give you a different value. Because one will give you the answer you want and the other won't. Because when you want to list a data frame, so what we're getting back is they were just told we're getting back three or four columns. So when you want to list the data frame, you want to list all of the columns into one big long vector. So now you have to put them back together again. Okay, so the unlist book by itself will not do this. Okay, and you could if you want to say, okay, I've got all these things. Now unlist each one. Or how do I get the first column out? So they want to list. I've got three columns again. We just, we just take a look at this. So let's create uh, a data frame with one, two, uh, one, two, three, and one, uh, and then uh, one, two, three of ten. Okay, so that's our data frame. And now we have a list here. Okay, it's all unravels. So now, how do I reorganize these back into columns? Because if I got two of these, I'm going to get two big flat ones. Okay. And now I'm going to have to do the match. I can do it. I can. You can do anything you want. Um, but it doesn't mean it's the best way to do it. Whereas the R line is saying, no, they all have exactly the same structure. They all have the same number of columns. They just have different number of rows, just stack them on top of each other. Okay. And that, that works a lot faster. Okay. Yeah. It, 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 it's much less code. It's just because I don't have to actually take cards. I have to get the order right. 
And this is the first week of the final discussion of the Okay, so this is going to be uh, what we call, which is letters one, two, three. Okay, this is the data frame. Okay, so that's actually, by the way, what is the second column? What is the class of the second column in this data frame? Well, <laughs> I know that they're not. I know that they're not characters. Okay, one of the really annoying things. Well, maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm not. Okay. 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 I, if I asked you to recall to do this, I bet you one of them would come back and say it's a character. And I would go, I know. <laughs> because let's take a look at the data frame function. This is another bad thing. Again, this is again it may sound as if I'm talking, uh, it may it may sound as if I'm wondering all over the place again. I'm trying to give you a sense of look at the right software you have software. I'm a very professional software. Talk to the people who are told that you can actually lie. You better know what, what, what's going on. And it could well, could well turn out that actually you do a character and do a factor. Okay? And the reason is because strings as factors have the default value of default of strings as factors. So let's, take a look. let's take a look at this. Okay, default of strings as factors. Okay, there we go. That is the definition of this function which gets called. If I had said strings as factors equals true or false, I would be able to control. Data frame function would have done. But I didn't specify. I said, I, I know what's going to happen, and I didn't know what was going to happen until somebody set the global function strings as factors to be something like half a factor. And then your code is going to be made totally different. It's got a global variable that's controlling how it behaves. Remember, I was telling you that people run your code and then say, it doesn't work for me. And you go, like, Can you tell me anything that you might have done? And I go, I didn't do anything. I just dropped it off. And go, in your .r profile, did you set any global variables? No, no, no. Only only no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. years ago, they did. They were friends of theirs. And their previous grad students were allowed told, here, use my .r profile. It has a nice feature. It's a nice function. Right? They didn't look at it. But they said, no, but this is very bad news. So actually, it's very nice and convenient if you want to only set once. And then I said the verbose is not true of the, of the tidy function to control the function. You can set an option. This is benign. This is print or not print. But this one will actually change the behavior of the function. And that's very bad. Okay? So set using global options. So you do not have to do that. In fact, using global options that using global variables help you do that. Okay? In fact, you don't notice that there's a global variable in this function. This is kind of <laughs> Okay, there's a global variable in this function. And I haven't defined it. So if I call hiding table set after it's done all the hard work, which is really long, because I want to fail before it gets to wasting my time, uh, I don't want to fix it. Anyone, anyone know what the, uh, what, what, what the global variable is? Okay, simple question. You want to know how I'm going to find the variable? Okay. No, ls is you use ls and all stuff, but no, ls is just the thing. So this all the variables in my workspace or in the package. But we're on state. We're not running this code. There's no variables. It's a, it's a function that will run. Go find me all the variables that it knows about. This is the new one. So anyway. Well, all of you uh, you think I'm down on heights. What do we get from here? <laughs> okay, okay. So the uh, so actually there is a function code tool find global code tools comes with us. You can just you can just look at this. You can just look to see what are the global variables in here. This is a very very useful thing. To do, okay, so very useful. Okay, when you're writing code, a lot of the way you write code in R is we open a text editor in R Studio and we write a command and 
we then hit the button that says send it to the send it to the to the, to the prompt. Okay, and it fails with the, the syntax error. So we fix the syntax error and we send it again and it fails because it does the wrong thing. And then we gradually we incrementally improve it and then it's that block dashed. Okay, then we move on to the next step. So we save that we, we say x equals this this computer computation. Then we go on to the next line it uses x y is equal to the f of x. Okay, that's great. And we literally incrementally build this up here yeah, in this composition. That is very, 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 very good at how computer science will help write the code. They say, here's the specification for our program. It's all, we know exactly what it's supposed to do now in the program. In data analysis, we don't actually know what we're going to do next. Okay, so this is why R has been built this way. Literally, I don't know. One of the reasons R exists and the S yes language exists is because that we know us, we invented, it used to tell us to be. Research on the industry and into those are not very, very, very rich in market. And what they used to have one very clever academics who did research and programmers who did their programming for the research. So if you said, let's go take a look at this plot, uh, this plot X against Y, so they could go off and program and they come back with the plot. And it became a little more than the industry search plot because they went off and went forth and they were using the media they were using. So they needed a, a better language. So the point is that was the way data analysis is and all is done, which is I don't know how to get to the next. I don't know whether it's a linear model or a quadratic model until I see the plot. I don't know whether it's going to be emission reduction or until I see as I see going on. So it's 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 uh, one of the intensity one line at a time. Then what we do is we like to write the scripts and we send them to the C code and that's usually kind of the game of the but then we, then we graduate on this. Let's put this into a function so we can use this. And the trouble with that is you have to create a variable called x, then you create another variable called y, okay? and then the, we have to, that, let's just say it reads a file. So that now becomes an input, this function, if you like. So you take this code and you put it inside a function, and then you create the new, if you like. It's always reading the same file. And you say, I don't do and you actually change the code and the input and the interactive use to actually go to this software. So, okay, so so we might be able to say, hey, what parameters, what function, what arguments do we function on our use? Okay, we'd like to also sort of say, which ones give you enough of fun? That's what we're going to use. Because when you say, my code is slow and then you send it to me, and I go, well, that's what we want to do, but we don't actually have what we do there. We don't have, we can do all the very things. Um, I don't know what they are, so I can't remember the code. You would send me these data as well if they are extremely complex. Which one is the global variable? I just asked it, find the globals, it looks through the function, and I said false to separate the function from the variable. These are all used, uh, these, are, these are all used in the function. Some are in the app, they are not defined. Return, that's what we call. We need the plus, don't take long. Don't need to worry about those. For the most part, we're okay with the function. Which of these guys are global variables? Let's take a look here. Let's go and take a look at the uh, site total. Ah, so this actually, how many of you use the title? Okay, so all of you know that what this is actually doing is actually constructing a new variable name. Site total CPU that gets signed back into here. So when we actually move it down below, it's actually running faster. Okay, so the fact you see where it's actually um, there it is, and there that's where we define it. It gets added as a column into this variable. And then because we're saying you take with this variable here, it gets pulled in here, we're actually able to see it in the new code. So why is so this is wrong? This, this is not a global variable. Because it is actually the fun how to use it. For those of you who don't know the language, and only about a third of you said you use the language. Did you is it clear that that is what happens? That the variable is being created as a column? If it is, it's not there's no way to do that. You can't be sure if you don't know the language. You know what that's doing, you know what it's functioning. Okay, so you can understand the evaluation. Okay, 
it's a motion up in the old, but it's actually added a column and change the change. That's fine, and it's useful, but it's fine. Now, so, so in fact, actually, in this case, I total thinking really actually not fine. It's not a total there, this is a whole problem. So let's look at size. There, these are variables. These are columns written by text. Let's look at the variable size. Okay, where is size getting used? There we see it's part of the data frame. So it's a column in the data frame. Yes. So it's a column in the data frame that we're we constructing each row. At each, at each, so it's a variable. Okay. Let's see where it's actually getting used. It's being used in group by, but that's inside the site. That's inside the tidy data that you constructed. So it's, it's referring to a column. Again, this is the title here. It's not saying ID data dollar size, because then we know what the column is not using that. So unfortunately, code tool isn't doesn't know about the titles because it's non-standard evaluation. Okay, we can go on. Okay. CPU reading is then getting dead. Okay, so there's seven it says the code tool says there's seven global variables. I look at two of them and not global variables because the ID data is Dealing in a totally non standard way for all of So, code two can't read it out. So, can we go and put together the file? So, this is one from the very last one. Okay, on um, merging non standard evaluation with standard evaluation and standard effort. We actually put that, we actually don't take a look at that. There's effort. Is used here outside of the papers. It's not a column here, it's literally a variable, but effort isn't defined. So, this is really important. We actually define the global variable because now I'm not talking about the options that behave differently, but I set the options and straight back. If I happen to have something called effort, it'll use it. And maybe something totally different from other projects. This is this is a little bit of a this is a little bit of a problem. I would say we use this, I recommend people use this. The right function is usually set to you have a global variable. Are there anything that you need to, that you need to actually clarify and do something with it? Okay, so, um, so this is all that we good. Okay, so we've got this. Anyone want to tell me how we're going to actually do this back? The same, the same one that we talked about before. Please. Actually, together together. You may you may argue that by the way, you may argue that um, all of this is taking advantage of this, but the built into language is still very reasonable to talk about. So um, it helps to know that things like they are so common uh, and the concept of vectorization is so important. So how do we go about doing this? They, 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 I want to actually even avoid making this list. I mean, this is a, I say in the in the GitHub in the GitHub. Uh, so you just to be clear. Okay, in the GitHub going to you go to here in the loop and you go to scripts and go into reading college. You can actually run all this code. And in this directory, you can run through this and you can actually see the six versions by book, and you'll see which ones are faster and why. To some extent, some of them aren't getting faster at all. So they get down to actually get down to speed. Uh, they get down to actually address 1400 times faster than 1400 times faster than the How is that So, what, what technique am I going to use? Anyone? Okay. Almost finished. Could you do the do that do that call on the function that you write? That's not going to be fast enough. That's still going to call a per row. It's going to actually. But what I need to do, what I need to do is vectorize this. Um, what I need to do is I need to vectorize this. What I kind of need is this. And we talk, we've actually several of you have mentioned the different pieces that we actually need. For this guy here, I need the number five. Let's say. Seven minus twelve plus one is six. Okay, and for here I get eight. I got eight, and I got three. In this case, so it's another, so it's another six. So it's one. So we get just basically seven plus eight. We get eight. Okay, eight rows. 
life is good. So what I want to do is I want to compute all this. How do I compute the how do I compute how many rows are going to come from each this is what, what we were saying before. We were saying we knew what they meant, how big the answer was. We the answer. We're not going to do that, but the answer is still updated. So, the number of rows. And I, I need the number of rows in the answer. Okay, so, so what I actually want to do is I want to compute this minus this plus one, this minus this plus one, this minus this plus one, and so forth. So let's just, let's just, so, so let's suppose that let's just make life a simple. Suppose this is a small one, this is a bigger one, always. Okay, so we have, so we don't deal with that. Okay, let's break the problem down to so if I could solve this, if I could assume this. So let's just assume this is the min and this is the max. Okay, so I can just compute max minus min plus one vector. I'll get I'll get this vector all in one go. Yes, and no thing involved in R. It's just you know, it's just it's just a simple calculation. Okay, now that tells me how many rows are. Now let's suppose we have a here. I need I need in my answer a a a a okay a again. This is important because this thing. So what I can actually do is I can do the following rep. This is let's call this n n n r okay. This is the number of rows for each row my the number of rows in the output so n n r of the output. If I just said rep of this guy, let's call this the sum. N R O. Okay. Okay. What's that going to be? That's going to have A A A. That's right. That's going to take A here. It's going to take B here, and then A and C. So this is going to be some A B A C. And this thing is a vector. Yeah? It's, it's got as many elements as there are rows. So what does this do? So this is now going to be six. Uh, eight, three, and one. And this is going to be A, B, A, and C. So what does rep do with this? It should be exactly what we want. The reality is it does. Okay? Because it's vectorized operation. There's no reason to do it. There's no level time. It's just actually the way we are repeating. Each element the correct number of times. We do this for each of the three columns that we want to do with that. But we have columns. Everyone with me on this? If we can solve if we can say that would be a good approach. And the loop goes out the window here. We are not R is free allocated, the answer is true. It's going to build this vector, then we need another vector, and another vector. It's going to free allocate those correctly. And then if you, if you do the columns together, which is really cheap. Okay, it's the rows that we take to it better. Uh, so that would be really, really fast. So there's a presumption here that I made that the final function falls. That's the first time. Yeah, so how are we going to solve that problem? Because I'm not going to move over those guys, but then I'm going to have to blow my weight here. Absolute value? I could take the absolute value and just make sure that I couldn't choose the right answer. Maybe. Well, what if I actually did is, what if I did the I'm not talking about bringing back in. See, now I can basically say, hey, go get a min of these two columns for each pair, for each, for each row essentially of this. So give me the min, and then go give me the max. And then I just subtract those two. Okay, from that one. That gives me my number of rows here. And now I'm back in the game. But this vector, because I didn't write a loop to do the, the pairwise and the pairwise. Okay, so this is going to actually do. I could also do another inspection so that this one is this bigger than that one. Okay, and then I get a big one vector of true and false, and then I can use that to get the things more exactly that. But uh, you know what I mean? That seems a little less direct. Okay, so then P and P max. But if you but that's more P and P max is a six, and P is a subset of one to the power. Okay, uh, which is again, that is the foundations of the language. So this actually, if you do it this way, it's full structure. There's no free allocating the answer. Okay, so a lot of this stuff goes away. Okay, and then um, uh, this 
so that's the problem. Okay, um, so basically, a lot of this stuff that the forward goes away, a lot of the actual pre allocation of the actual forward disappears. So, this could become a lot smaller. Well, if you just need kind of lots of that, then so this is good. Okay, and we like, we, we like both of those happening. Um, uh, vectorization is so important here. If you think this way, it's a massive problem. You actually have to do things one bit at a time, or even the R bottom. Create that this bit of time here. So I get to make it kind of more numbers out. I can't get a factor of about six here until I need to do this. So I'm going to do this question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's what we do. Okay, so that's the uh, next one. Um, okay, so we have the next one. Okay, so we have the next one. 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 Yeah. Uh, I would like to know what you want to talk about. I, uh, I have things in mind, uh, but I have time for over three days. So if you want to tell me, I would really appreciate that. Not just the idea you get, but the question. Okay, so we have a talk again on Wednesday at 4 30. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 I don't know.